Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Museum of Science live program, Live Animals, Species in Peril. Today, we're going to be talking to our staff at the Live Animal Center to learn more about some of the museum's resident creatures. My name is Mike, and I'll be your moderator during today's program, which means that I'll be fielding all of your questions that you ask our presenters. To ask a question or share um, any thoughts or ideas, just press the Q&A button on your screen and include your name and age if you'd like a shout out if we end up using your question. If you'd like to see captions, you can click on the closed captions button also at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles. And if you're joining us on Facebook, we're so pleased that you're tuning in today, but please know that we cannot see your questions uh, on that platform. So at this point, I'll invite our presenters to turn on their cameras, introduce themselves, and then we will get started. Hi everyone, I'm Liz, assistant curator from our live animal center. Helping me out today with the camera and animal work will be Corey, our invertebrate keeper. Now our show today is titled Species in Peril. So we are gonna feature two of our animals that live here at the museum that are actually endangered species. So that means there aren't that many of them left out in the wild. That might sound like a sad subject and it kind of is, but I wanna to talk to you guys a little bit about what we are doing to help these species. So without further ado, Corey is gonna do her best to get our animals up on the camera. Now, I actually think she is gonna have the harder job today. These animals are quite active. So we're gonna have uh, that animal camera up in just a moment. We're having, I think, a slight technical gl glitch trying to get that camera up. Um, so I don't think, oh, there it is, a little bit of a delay. I promise these animals will be worth the wait. Now, while Corey's trying to get them up on the camera, I'm going to introduce them. These animals are our cotton top tamarins. Now, cotton top tamarins belong to the smallest family of monkeys, which are called the calatricids. Now, calatricids include marmosets and tamarins. Yeah, that's a pretty good shot of one right there. Like I said, they're gonna be pretty active, so Corey is gonna have a, a tough time trying to get them on camera as best she can. Now, cotton top tamarins in the wild are native to tropical forests of Northwest Colombia. That is the only place you will find them. Now, these animals are diurnal, meaning they're active mostly at daytime. They are also arboreal. So they spend pretty much all of their time up in trees. You guys will certainly see that during this presentation today. Now, other kind of neat facts about these animals in the wild, they are very social. They typically live in social groups of two to nine individuals. Can be up to 13, but two to nine animals in a group is pretty average. Now at the head of that social group is one breeding pair. They are the dominant pair and they are the only ones that breed in that group. Tamarins are actually pretty neat. They do something known as cooperative breeding. That means even though there's only the one pair that breeds, others will help raise those youngsters, kind of for the good of the group. So that's a really neat thing they do. It's called cooperative breeding. Now that I've shared some kind of fun facts about how they behave in the wild, you guys are probably curious as to how these animals became endangered. Why did they become a species in peril? There's actually a couple different reasons. The main thing that really affected these tamarins was their habitat was destroyed. So they live in those rainforests and a lot of that was cut down um, for different agriculture, uh, some logging. So most of their habitat was destroyed. It is believed that their habitat went down to about 5% what it once was. So they just had a much smaller area in which to live. Another thing that really affected them is they were actually taken from the wild for the illegal pet trade. So a lot of people did want them as pets because they think they're really cute. So that's another thing that was a problem. Finally, thousands, up to 40,000 of these tamarins were taken from the wild and used for research back in the 60s and 70s. 
these primates, these tamarins can actually get colon cancer. So they were studied for that reason. Now, people decided they needed to intervene. And after 1976, they made several laws that made it so you could not use these monkeys for research anymore. Uh, further still, there are actually now things in place that are known as a species survival plan. Now, sometimes you'll hear that called SSP. Now, this is a plan that is coordinated by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So here at the museum, we are actually an accredited zoo. So this species survival plan is basically a captive breeding program. So overall, this plan has about 1,200, so 1,200 monkeys at all zoos across the country. And it's the way that we can really get their numbers up and stable in captivity. So they know uh, they have good genetics, they pair certain monkeys to breed with other ones. Uh, they basically keep track of all of these monkeys that we have in different zoos. Now, unfortunately, because their habitat is pretty destroyed, where we are right now, it isn't in a place that these animals can be released back into the wild. Um, however, they have done some release with other kinds of monkeys. There's something called a golden lion tamarind, and they have been able to do some reintroduction with that species. So right now, the focus is just to get those numbers up in captivity, do the best we can to have stable populations of cotton top tamarinds in zoos. Maybe one day things will be in a place that we are able to release these animals back into the wild. Now, you guys are probably curious about this particular pair of monkeys that are uh, doing a pretty good job hiding. And uh, like I said, Corey is having a pretty rough time trying to find them in the exhibit. Now these two monkeys, a little bit about them. It's a male and female pair. Our male Darwin has actually been at the museum for about six years. And uh, he actually did have a former companion who unfortunately died about a year ago. So his new companion, Jane, is actually pretty brand new to him. She actually only got to the museum about two months ago. And this pair that you're looking at have only been together for a couple weeks. Uh, so basically with them, we just kind of say, stay tuned, see how they're uh, getting along. We'll definitely keep people posted as to their progress. Um, but right now they're doing really well together. Um, so why don't I turn it over and see if we have any questions. You actually just answered one of those questions, Liz, which is, um, do the monkeys have names? But we have yeah. another one from Elizabeth, age eight, um, asking if these animals are primates. Yes, so cotton top tamarins certainly are primates. Uh, there's lots of different kinds of primates. We as humans are primates, in fact, um, but they belong to the small group of monkeys that are called the calatricids. So the members of the calatricid group of monkeys are the uh, tamarins and then marmosets, if any of you have heard of marmosets before. Do we have any other questions? We have a new question. We just have a new one that came in. Uh, what do these animals eat? That's a great question. I actually put a bunch of food in right before the show started with the hope that they would really focus on those snacks and focus on the food and that Corey wouldn't have quite as much trouble trying to follow them with the camera. They actually, believe it or not, eat a canned monkey food. It's called the marmoset diet. So it's a canned food that's made of a lot of different things, uh, kind of like ground up protein, insect material. That would be similar to things they would eat in the wild. In the wild, they eat a lot of insects. That is a big portion of their diet. They also eat plenty of fruits that they can find, actually sap, nectar, gum. Um, so they're really not too picky and they are technically omnivores. So they will eat both plant and animal material. So here at the museum, they eat that canned monkey food. Uh, it's hard to tell what he's eating right now, but I think it's a little piece of fruit that he found. Um, banana, apple, pretty much varied fruits and vegetables. Uh, and then they do get mealworms uh, are some of their favorite treats, crickets, other insects. Any other questions? Uh, 
Okay, we do have a couple more questions. I'm sorry, this I actually is, missed, I missed um, that question, Mike. How old Michael. are they and how long can the species live? Great. Um, oh, sure, I'm sorry about so that. We have a question about how old okay. these animals are and how long can they live? So our male Tamarin Darwin is about eight years old. Our female Jane is actually younger. She's only about four years old. Uh, they normally live into their teens. Uh, 14, 15 is pretty common to see. They tend to live more or longer in captivity. It's a lot easier to survive when someone is taking care of you. The oldest on record was 24 years old. All right, I'll take another question if there are okay, any coming in. We also in. have, Vivian, age nine, asks about their tails and asks specifically, are they prehensile? So you may want to explain what that means and if they apply to the tamarins. That's a great question. So prehensile means grasping. So it's almost like the, an animal that has a prehensile tail can use it like it's an extra limb use it like an arm or leg, kind of wrap around tree branches. Now their tails, the cotton top tamarind's tails are pretty cool, um, but you probably noticed, I think they just both gave you a pretty good shot of them walking across a branch. They don't use those tails to wrap around. They're more for balance. So they do not have a prehensile tail, um, but many uh, primates do. So that was a really great question and a good observation. All right, I'll take another question. I think this one is also based on an observation that our audience has made. Elizabeth sees them jumping around and wonders how far they can jump. That's, you know, that's a good question that I actually don't have a perfect answer to. Um, it's pretty common for them in the wild to jump from tree branch to tree branch. Um, so I don't know if a scientist has ever measured exactly how far they can jump. Uh, I certainly see ours here at the museum jumping easily several feet. Um, from branch to branch, but they probably at their absolute furthest jump could go even further than that. And we've got one final question, which is how fast are these animals? That's another one that I don't have a great answer to. Um, they're not often on the ground just running since they do spend most of their time up in trees. With that being said, they are very quick animals. As you can see, Corey's having a really hard time keeping them up on camera because they're just running and jumping around so much. Um, so I don't know, maybe someone has done a study to see how quick their jumps are, um, but I have not come across that information if it is out there. Uh, you guys had some good hard questions. Here's another one based on an observation. Um, they see some little boxes on the screen hanging from the branches. What are those boxes used for? So if you're talking about the little kind of colored squares that you're looking at, those are actually some food bowls. So we find a couple different ways to present food to them to make it interesting and fun. Um, there are some larger boxes within the exhibit that are actually nest boxes. So we provide a place for the tamarins to uh, sleep during the night um, that they might enjoy a little bit more than trying to sleep while you're holding onto a tree branch. Um, so yeah, there's a couple different boxes in there that I think you guys have been seeing. And we have another question about um, what are the closest relatives to these animals? So there are some other kinds of tamarins. There's ac actually something called the Jeffrey's tamarin, tamarin, which is technically a subspecies. It kind of looks like a cotton top tamarin if you shaved its head. <laughs> so it still has white, but it's very short on the top of the head. So I'd say that's probably their closest relative. Other than that, they are related to other species of tamarins and then those marmosets, so other small monkeys uh, that I mentioned before. And we're not seeing any other questions right now. This is just a reminder, if you do have any additional questions to type those in the Q&A box. I have a question for you, Liz. Sure. which is right now I'm only seeing two tamarins in this enclosure. In the past, has the museum had more of these cotton top tamarins? 
Yes, in the past, we have had uh, different pairs of tamarins. We actually had a breeding family for several years. Um, those monkeys have since died, um, but we did have at our peak, we had a mother, a father, one litter, which was a boy and a girl, and then one single. So we had a group of five at one point, um, but that was many years ago. Um, so yep, we just have the two in the exhibit for now. And here's a question from all the way from Atlanta, Georgia, the Hutchinson Elementary School, asking specifically, where are these animals from? So these two particular individuals are members of the species survival plan. So they uh, initially are from other zoos. Zoos can kind of coordinate to one with one another um, to exchange monkeys that would be good fits for them. In the wild, their native habitat is tropical forests of Northwest Colombia. We have another great question, which is um, how do they grasp onto the branches? And then I think this uh, person is also observing that they're sort of playing with each other a little bit. I mean, how, um, how do they express uh, themselves with play? Wow, those are great questions. These might actually have to be our last questions so that we have time to focus on our next animal, but those were great. So these tamarins actually have claws. A lot of primates have things more like nails, kind of like what ours look like, but these tamarins actually have sharp claws that are almost squirrel-like. So that really helps them cling onto the branches. Since we discussed that they don't have a grasping tail, really their claws are what are gonna help them best hang onto branches. And then those are some great observations that you did see them maybe playing with one another. Sometimes you'll see them grooming with one another. Uh, since they are a so social species, it's just kind of like us, how we bond with our friends, uh, our siblings, that's just kind of their way of doing that. They do a lot of vocalizations. So they do have a pretty big dialogue. Things mean different, if they're warning one another about a predator that's around, that has different uh, kind of noises. There's different noises for different foods that they get. So they do have a pretty uh, wide range of communication. Wonderful Liz, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing all that information. I know we have a second animal to get to. Uh, while you're getting ready, I'll just put up a picture of the tamarins with a little bit more information about them so that people can learn a little bit more about them while we're waiting for animal number two. I think we are just about ready. Now the next animal Corey is going to be holding. So I think this one will be a little bit easier for her to keep track of. Now this endangered species is actually a Massachusetts resident. So I think without further ado, I'm gonna have Corey bring this animal up on the camera. See if you guys recognize it. All right. So I know most of you are probably immediately thinking turtle and you would be absolutely correct. This certainly is a turtle. Now this is a turtle species that is called a Northern red belly cooter. Kind of a funny name. Uh, now these turtles are freshwater. That means you will not find them in the ocean. So they're not sea turtles. They live in freshwater lakes and ponds. Now, believe it or not, I know this one is pretty small right now, but when they get to full size, they are the second largest freshwater turtle in New England. They're second only to the snapping turtle, which is the largest freshwater turtle in New England. Now these Northern red belly cooters are actually pretty restricted in terms of their range where you will find them in the state of Massachusetts. They are native only to Plymouth County. So it's a pretty small area where you're, you will naturally find these turtles. Now you may be wondering, thinking to yourself, we have lots of pond turtles uh, here in New England. How come this one is endangered? How come this one is not doing well? Uh, and there's a couple reasons. Kind of like with our cotton top tamarins, it's not always one easy story as to why an animal is endangered. But a few things that really affected these turtles, one was their habitat, kind of similar to the cotton top tamarins. 
Since these turtles are already restricted to a pretty small area in Plymouth County, when wetlands got destroyed, anytime people built on something, it really cut down an area that was already pretty small to begin with for these turtles. So that's one thing that affected them. Also, these turtles take a long time to reach maturity. So a female can't reproduce or have babies until she's 20 years old. So it takes them a long time to even be able to make it to reproduce. Finally, these turtles have lots and lots of predators. When they're eggs, before they even have a chance to hatch, many things eat turtle eggs. Skunks, raccoons, opossums are all known to eat turtle eggs. Then when these turtles hatch, they're only about the size of a quarter. So even though they're still pretty tiny, size of a quarter is really, really tiny. Even though they have a strong shell to protect themselves, many things can still crunch through a quarter sized turtle. To give you a couple examples, some birds, things like crows are able to do it. Believe it or not, American bullfrogs are a really big predator for hatchling turtles. So imagine a frog eating a turtle. They do it when they're first hatched. Pretty much any other big predator would love to eat a newborn turtle. So they have lots and lots of predators. So those are a couple things that kind of affected these turtles. So actually it was discovered back in about 1980, it's when we realized these turtles were really in trouble and they were given full protection under the Endangered Species Act. It was estimated that there were only less than 300 red belly turtles native out in the wild uh, in Plymouth County. That's a really small number. A few years later, in 1984, a special program was developed, and this was called the Northern Red Belly Cooter Head Start Program. Now, it's actually coordinated by the Mass Department of Fish and Wildlife. Now, what this Head Start program does, first, the experts tracked where the females would lay their eggs, where they would have their nests up on land. So they'd find where these nests were going to be, and then when they saw the females lay the eggs, they actually protected those eggs. They would put fences around them so predators couldn't get at those eggs. Next, they waited. Once those babies hatched, usually in September is when these animals hatch, they actually, most of them just went back into the wild. They found their way to water, but they took a number of these turtles, about 200 turtles, and gave them to different institutions like the Museum of Science, uh, the aquarium usually participates. Many other zoos in the area might also participate in this program. So we get the turtles in September and our job is to get the turtles nice and big uh, and they will ultimately be released next May. So we keep them very, very warm. We give them lots and lots of lettuce to eat. And our goal is to get them to a certain size. So our goal is actually three inches in shell length. I think we're already more than halfway there or close to halfway there with the ones that we already have. The idea is once a turtle reaches three inches in shell length, very few animals are able to eat turtles of that size. It's getting to that critical size that was such a problem and the turtles were having such a hard time doing in the wild. So that's our goal, three inches. And then these turtles will be released, uh, returned to Fish and Wildlife and released next May. Now this is a actually kind of happy story because this is a wildlife success story. So this is one where reintroduction is happening every year. The museum has been participating in this Head Start program pretty much since the beginning and over 4,000 turtles have been released into Plymouth County. That's pretty awesome. They also do track these turtles when they are released. And they have found that turtles that were released 20 years ago are now reproducing. So they are actually coming up on land and laying their own eggs. So it is definitely a successful story. Now, I'm sure there are a couple questions that I can turn it over to Mike if you have any about our Northern Red Belly Cooters. 
We don't have any questions from the visitors yet, but I wanted to ask, at what point um, would these turtles no longer be considered endangered? You mentioned releasing 4,000 of them. What, um, what numbers do you need to sort of get off that list? You know, that's a really good question. And it's actually a question I kind of have come up with myself. Um, I think Mass Fish and Wildlife is trying to figure out if they're at a point that they're stable enough that maybe they take a few years off from the Head Start program, then maybe evaluate in a couple years. So I think they're still trying to figure things out, um, but definitely probably in the thousands is probably getting pretty close to a stable population. They're definitely still a species of concern since we are still working on head starting, but they're probably not, they're definitely not as critically endangered as those cotton top tamarins that we met before. Great answer, thank you for sharing that Liz. Uh, we have a question about uh, their relationship to painted turtles. Are they related to painted turtles? And also how big will they eventually get? They do kind of look like painted turtles, don't they? But they're not very closely related. Um, they don't have quite the same bright colors as painted turtles do. Um, they also have that characteristic red belly. Corey's giving you a good view of that now. Um, so I agree that they do kind of look like painted turtles. Um, but they are not very closely related. Only that they're um, Massachusetts uh, freshwater turtles, um, not very closely related beyond that. And then full size. Okay, oh, sorry, the size one, I just remember that. <laughs> they get to about 10 inches in shell length at full size. So they do get pretty big. We are also getting lots of questions about um, their names. Do we name these turtles like we do our tamarins? So since these turtles are only with us temporarily, we actually have six of them here at the museum. We have them from September until the following May. We tend to not name them um, just because I think they're only here with us for a short time. If you guys wanted to give them some temporary names, you are certainly welcome to do that. Um, but we don't name them since we're not going to keep them forever. Thank you for sharing. We've been getting a number of questions about what um, they eat for food. So when they're young, they eat mostly vegetation. So we're actually feeding them lots and lots of lettuce, romaine, red leaf lettuce. Uh, in the wild, they would eat certainly uh, any vegetation they find in the water. Um, they also will start to eat uh, more meat as they get bigger too. Um, they will eat insects, crayfish, small fish if they're able to get them. Um, so they do have a pretty varied diet, uh, worms if they can get it. Um, but right now they're mostly just eating lettuce here with us. We had another great question about their habitat, um, both in the wild and then what is their um, habitat here at the museum? Where do they, where do they live? So their habitat in the wild um, would just be like any freshwater lake or pond that you could picture. Maybe you go on hikes somewhere near you and there's a nice pond with lots of uh, rocks. Maybe there's some uh, plants, uh, things like that. Um, a lot of times you will see pond turtles basking. So sitting up alongside the shore and getting some sunlight. So that's a little bit what their wild habitat looks like. There's only so much we can do to make that beautiful habitat here at the museum. So they pretty much live in a tank of water. We have some rocks set up so they can do that basking and pull themselves up. Um, but it is a pretty, uh, pretty simple habitat that we set up for them for the months that we have them. And I think because of time, this will have to be our last question. What do these turtles do um, during the winter? in the wild when it's very, very cold here in New England? That's a really great question. And to tell you the truth, a lot of them have a really hard time surviving uh, because it is so cold. Um, this head start that we do for them really does help the species. When they're released at that three inches, they're the size that turtles in the wild, it would take them years, three or four years to get to that size. Um, so a lot of them unfortunately do not uh, survive. Um, they sort of have a way of hibernating, but a lot of them will not make it through their first winter, sadly. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing, uh, Liz.
Um, I'm sorry, friends, but that are all out of time here. I'd like to invite our presenters to say goodbye to everyone. Thanks so much, guys. And thank all. Let's see, just change my slide here. Hold on one second. There's some information about the red belly cooters. But there we are. All right. So thank you again for joining us. You can see all of our virtual offerings at the website www.mos.org slash MOS at home, where you can find all sorts of different programs that we have. And also, if you're able to, you can support the museum by visiting engage.mos.org slash welcome. We thank you again for joining us and for your awesome questions. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day and can join us for programs in the future. Thanks again and take care. <laughs>